I'm posting this as a warning. There are things out there that you don't want to know about. Stay away from them. Don't go looking for them. I'll tell you my story in hopes that it will quench your curiosity. It was a night like any other night, at least lately. I had barely arrived at the ranger station, and there were already four calls of vacationers' homes getting broken into. Out here in the West Virginia Wildlife Preserve, people tend to think that just because they plant some houses that the animals should somehow know and respect boundaries. That's kind of tough when the animals are on a huge plot of land where they've never been hunted and never even been threatened by anything other than a bigger animal. Folks seem to think that it's a great vacation spot for them. What they don't realize is it's also a great vacation spot for animals. I hopped in the company truck and stored it toward my first destination of the night. An elderly couple had been terrorized by a deer that literally broke in through the sliding glass door. They managed to trap it inside a room and needed someone to go and release it. I got elected. When I got there, the vacationers looked like the ones caught in headlights. They were still wide-eyed. I could tell that they were in shock. I had them go into another room and close the door. Once they were out of the way, I found the closest door to the outside and opened it. Then I went to the room with the deer. I slowly opened the door and was shocked to find the room covered in blood. The deer was lying on the floor, panting. I approached it slowly, circling around to leave the doorway open, hoping to give it an escape route. The closer I got, the more I realized this deer wasn't going anywhere. Its side was covered with claw marks. At first, I thought a coyote had attacked it, but the marks were too far apart. They were large enough to be caused by a bear, but the individual claws were too far apart. I'd never seen anything like this. If I had to compare it to something, I'd say Freddy Krueger sliced it up. The deer's eyes went wide when I approached it, but it didn't jump up and run. I took this as a bad sign. Its breath came in ragged gasps as I struggled to roll it over. Once I did, it was my turn to struggle breathing. Its entire side was torn to shreds, but that wasn't the worst part. There were large chunks that were missing. I examined the wounds and found bite marks where the missing flesh should have been, but the bites were massive. If it wouldn't have challenged the laws of nature, as well as my own sanity, I would have said it was bitten by a shark. Blood poured out of the side, and the deer struggled to draw breath. I stood and left the room, leaving the poor creature to the dignity of a private death. When I went back in, it was still. I took pictures with my cell phone and tried my best to carry the creature out without making more of a mess. After I got it loaded onto the back of my truck, I went back inside and talked to the vacationers. When I opened the door to the room they were in, the woman's eyes grew wide and she started screaming. The man's eyes were the size of saucers as well. I approached them slowly with my arms outstretched to try to calm them down. It seemed to have the opposite effect. They started climbing the furniture, clawing at the walls to get away from me. I decided to back away and give them some room. What's wrong? I said. The man pointed a shaky finger at me. You're covered in blood, he said. The deer got you, the woman said. You've got rabies. Or worse, the man said, keeping his distance. I'm sorry, folks, I said. This is the deer's blood. You killed it just for breaking in? The woman asked, What? 
No, it, it was already injured. I just took it to my truck. The couple seemed to settle down and consider this. So you don't have rabies? The man said, slowly looking me up and down. Or anything else? The woman said, hiding behind her husband. No, ma'am, I'm fine. She took her turn, eyeing me up and down. I assumed looking for wounds. Being satisfied, they asked the one question I didn't want to answer. So what killed the deer? The man said. I really don't know, I said truthfully. Having just gotten them calmed down, I didn't want to send them back into a panic. It was probably just a coyote, I said. A coyote? The man said, diving back into the pool of panic. Or a bear, I said, trying and failing to calm them. A bear? The woman said, diving in after her husband. You know, folks, you've had a traumatic night, I said. I can't tell you what to do, but if I were you, I'd... We're leaving, the woman said, dragging her husband out of the room. That sounds like a good idea, I said, and like an idiot, I added, I hope you enjoyed your stay. They either didn't hear me or ignored me. Either way, it wasn't long until I heard a car start and then roar away from the house. I went back into the room where the deer had been trapped and still working backwards from there, trying to find out what happened. It wasn't hard to pick up the trail. It had been bleeding badly. Seeing the bites and claw marks made that fairly obvious. I tracked back through the kitchen and out the smashed glass door. Once outside, I turned on my flashlight. The trail was a little harder to follow, but not much. I could still see drops of blood besides its tracks as I followed them back toward the pond behind the house. I approached the pond and saw signs of a struggle. This must have been where the deer was attacked. There were other tracks with the deers, but they didn't make any sense to me. They were large, too large. Their shape was odd as well. If I had to call them anything, I would have called them duck prints, but massive larger than any duck by many times. A giant duck with shark teeth. I think I'll leave that out of my report, I thought. It suddenly struck me what the tracks were. It was a man with swim fins on his feet. But why? Why go through all the trouble to poach a deer when you can just knock it out with a tranquilizer gun? My mind sent me an answer, but I didn't like it. What if the man is a psychopath, just getting his kicks by killing an animal with his bare hands? I thought about the mental hospital in the neighboring county and wondered if one of the patients had taken an unsanctioned leave of absence and they were trying to keep it quiet. I didn't like the thought one bit. Aside from the fact that it didn't explain the huge bites on the deer, it also meant that we had someone who might suddenly get a taste for killing. Doing this to animals was horrible, but what if he decided to go after something bigger? Shot a look at the house, wondering how many vacationers were within a short walk from this spot, and how many were armed. As I contemplated the safety of the people in the area, I heard something behind me. I whipped around and shone my light, but saw nothing. I scanned the pond and saw a ripple emanating from the middle. Probably just a fish jumping. I took some more pictures of the struggle area with my phone, then started back toward my truck. I had more calls to answer, and this riddle would have to wait. I drove halfway around the lake, about three miles, to the other vacation home where a break-in had been reported. When the woman in her thirties answered the door, she took a step back. 
Oh, my, she said, looking at the dried blood all over my uniform. Good evening, ma'am. I'm sorry about my appearance, I said. Did you report a break-in? Yes, we did. Please, come in. She said in a friendly tone, yet gave me a wide berth while closing the door. She led me upstairs to the kitchen. For some reason, I was expecting to find blood all over, like with the last house. However, this was a completely different mess. She showed me the door. It had been forced open, but not shattered like the last one. There was only a small amount of glass broken. Then the door latch had been unlocked and the door slid open. There were faint images of my duck tracks like the last house. My spine turned to ice. This house was over three miles away from the other. There were many more people in that space that might have fallen victim to this crazed person. The woman showed me the rest of the kitchen and the mess that had been left. There were a few cans of sardines that had been opened and eaten, and also some cans of fresh tuna. The strange thing was how they were open. The cans had been torn into with something sharp, but not a can opener. The marks looked like they were torn open with claws. I shuddered to imagine the amount of strength it took to do something like that. And then I spotted it. Besides one of the trash cans of tuna was a small puddle of blood. Ma'am, could I trouble you for a sandwich bag? I asked. She handed me one, and I carefully tried to scrape as much blood as possible. I sealed it and put it in my pocket and then went out through the broken door. Behind the house, just like with most of these vacation houses, there was a pond. I traced the tracks back to it, and they disappeared at the water line. I shone my light over the water, but the only thing I saw was a stray turtle. I stared at it for a long time, as though it would somehow give me a clue as to what was going on. What should we do? The woman said, nearly scaring me half to death. I hadn't heard her follow me out of the door and into the yard. I'll send someone around to look at that door in the morning, I said. In the meantime, it might not be a bad idea to sleep in a room that has a lock on the door. I'm sure they won't be back, but just in case. She didn't seem very comforted by that idea, but thanked me as I left. The next two reports were just teenagers breaking in and stealing beer. That was it. No bloody wildlife, no weird tricks, just kids being kids. I went back to the station, changed out of my bloody uniform, and spent the rest of the night filling out reports on what had happened. When my shift was over and I passed on what had happened, I took a little trip to the neighboring county. I stopped in at the mental hospital and asked if they had any escapees lately. The nurse looked at me like I had asked her if she was wearing deodorant. We don't have escapees, she said with obvious pride that showed as arrogance. I thanked her and left, feeling less than satisfied with her answer. Next, I stopped at the local police department and asked one of my friends on the force if they could analyze the blood sample for me. I shared my thoughts that there might have been an escapee from the mental hospital and the blood sample might help us find out who and track him down. It was well past noon until I got to bed. That night when I got to work, it was pandemonium. There had been more break-ins and people were starting to panic. The owner of the resort was frantic. People were canceling left and right and wanting their money back. When I walked in, he stormed his pudgy face right up to mine. You told people to go home? He fumed, glaring up at me. I merely suggested, do you want to pay their rent out of your salary? I work for the state, not you, 
I said. He turned a deeper shade of red. Would you rather see people in body bags instead of animals? I asked. That wouldn't do much for business, now would it? He turned fire engine red and stormed out, mumbling, We'll see. I investigated five break-ins that night. Only two of them were legit. The rest seemed like half-hearted attempts to stage a break-in so that they could get out of paying for their rental. The two real ones shared the same characteristics as before. Just enough of a broken window to open the door. The cans of whatever seafood was available. They even got shrimp out of the freezer. Everything about the way the intruder acted pointed to a person. All I needed to know was who. Again, I followed the tracks back to the nearby pond. I stood for a long time studying the surface of the water. I knew these ponds were all designed the same, a roughly 40-yard by 40-yard body of water around five feet deep in the middle, stocked with mostly bluegill for catch-and-release fishing. Anyone using these ponds to hide would have to be holding their breath for inhuman periods of time. I stared at the surface for 20 minutes. If someone was out there, they had an invisible snorkel or an extra set of lungs. After my rounds of the investigating and reporting, I decided to stick around and do a little extra investigating. I ran home, grabbed my swim trunks, mask, and snorkel, and went to the site of the most recent break-in. I waded out into the water, unsure of what I would find when a snake slithered past me. I let it go and waded deep enough to where I could swim. I hovered at the level of the surface, dipping my mask underwater to get a glimpse of whatever there was to see. There wasn't much, fish, underwater plants, and lots of water. Just what you would expect from a pond. As I kept going towards the middle, the water was getting deeper. I now couldn't touch the bottom. I had to float on the surface. Looming in front of me was a dark spot on the bottom of the pond. I took it for a rock, but swam close enough to investigate it anyway. In for a penny, in for a pound. As I drew close enough to hover over it, I realized it wasn't a rock. I took a deep breath and dove to find out what it was. The further I swam down, the further I was able to swim down. I kept going and going. Light disappeared. I was sure I had been swimming straight down for a solid minute without touching the bottom. I turned and looked up. The surface of the pond was only a pinprick of light. My lungs screamed at me to turn around. I had no choice but to comply. I clawed at the water in desperation. It seemed like I was swimming in mud or something was pulling me down. Almost like a force or current pushing against me, wanting me to drown before I could fully explore this hidden secret. After what felt like an eternity, I broke the surface of the water and gasped for air. I swam over to the shallows and walked out of the pond. I collapsed on the shore and lay there for a long time, trying to regain my breath. As my brain received oxygen, I thought about what had happened and if it had been real, an illusion, or if I had just gotten turned around somehow and stuck at the bottom. I had to find out. I wasted no time driving two counties over and renting some dive equipment, along with a light. So armed, I returned to the pond and walked toward the middle again. This time, when I dove toward the dark spot, I was able to see exactly what it was. I used the flashlight to examine the darkness. As I swam deeper, the sides closed in on me as if I was swimming down the gullet of some massive fish. I've never been claustrophobic before, 
but that was rapidly changing. I barely had any room to maneuver as the sides closed in. I contemplated turning around, but there was no room. I could feel myself start to panic. I had to focus to keep my breaths regular. I was very close to a panic attack when suddenly the tunnel opened up again. The sides grew further apart. I checked my watch, and I had been under for 15 minutes. The sides of the tunnel had spread out so far that they were barely visible, and I could see a light ahead of me. I swam toward it, desperate to get out of this water. I broke through the surface and looked around. I was in the pond. Somehow, I had gotten turned around, and I was back in the pond. I swam to the side until I could stand and walk out into the shore. Looking around, I made a startling discovery. I was in a pond, the same one as the break-in last night. Somehow, there was a hidden tunnel between the two ponds. That's how the robber never gets caught. He just swims to the next pond, slick as snot, no fuss, no muss. I now knew the how, but I needed to know more. As tempting as it was to swim back through the tunnel, I was still a little shaken and didn't want to risk an underwater panic attack. I walked back to my truck, took off my diving equipment, and drove back to the dive shop. I asked about frequent customers, especially for refilling tanks. They told me they had a few regulars that came in every weekend, but no one knew and no one who needed refill more than once a week. I asked if there were any other dive shops in the area and they told me the next closest one was over a hundred miles away. I went home frustrated. It wasn't making sense. He would need air to swim back and forth through that tunnel, and that was his escape route. I was sure of it. I tried to sleep through the afternoon, but my mind wouldn't let me rest. It was working on the impossible puzzle of how the robber was getting air. I borrowed a couple of trail cans and set one up at each pond. I needed to see if he had some new tank system or what. I also wanted to identify him and shut him down fast. I made sure to stay away from those ponds that night so he would feel free to do his thing. In the morning, I gathered the cameras and took them home. I downloaded both memory cards before watching the video. Just as the second download was finishing, my phone rang. Hello, I said. Hey, John, it's Steve. I got the results from that blood you gave me the other day. Oh, great, I said, hitting the play button on my computer. Were you able to get a match on any hospital records? Not exactly. Why not? I asked as a ghostly green image appeared on my computer. The image was blurred, but it was definitely the size of a man walking upright toward the camera. I clicked to the next slide and froze at what I saw. Well, the thing is, the blood you gave me came back as reptile. DNA. I registered the words that he said in my mind, just like I registered the image on my computer screen, but I just couldn't place them in reality. Are you there? He said into the phone. Yes, I'm sorry. Could you send a copy of your findings to my office? Sure, no problem. Thanks, I appreciate it. You really helped me figure this out. Any time, he said cheerfully, uh, before hanging up. I hadn't taken my eyes off of the computer screen the whole time. No matter how long I stared at it, I couldn't make my mind acknowledge that it was real. Standing there, large as life, was not a man in a wetsuit. 
It was a creature. I could see the wide mouth, full of sharp teeth, that looked exactly like the bite marks on the deer. I could see the webbed feet that looked like swim fins, only they had claws sticking out on the front where the toes should be. I saw the razor-sharp claws on its webbed hands. It was a full-on nightmare staring me in the face. I sat back in thought for a long time. Then I printed copies of the image and put them in an envelope. I rushed to the station to share the information that I had with my fellow rangers. As I was showing them, their faces ranged in emotions from shock to disbelief to outright mocking. As I was going through my investigation, the owner of the timeshares walked in. What are we all looking at? He said, eyeing me with contempt. It seems like John has solved the case of the break-ins, one of the other rangers said. The owner approached. He picked up the lab report and read it, then stared for a long time at the picture. Do you know what this is? He said absently. I really don't know yet, I said. I've never seen anything like it. He turned to me and smiled. This is money, he said, holding up the picture. What do you mean, I said. Those idiots that go around hunting with, what do you call them things? Cryptids. Yeah, uh, cryptids. They'll pay through the nose if they think they can find something like this. And then there's the TV shows, the merchandising, he said. You may have saved my financial hide. He beamed at me. I don't think you understand, I said. This is a dangerous animal. If you had seen what it did to that deer. So what do you want to do? Hunt it down and kill it? Maybe not kill it, but definitely tranquilize it and take it to a secure location where it can't hurt anyone. You dumb SOB, he yelled. I could make a mint. I wouldn't even have to repair the houses. They would all rush in to investigate and leave piles of cash in my bank account. But what about the people? Who cares about the people, he said. Throw them all out. I've got a chance of a lifetime beating down my front door, and you want to flush it down the toilet because you're scared someone might break a nail. He was breathing hard and staring up into my face. The air was charged with fury, his and mine, and then a sudden calm came over him. Charles, he said, addressing the lead ranger, isn't this a wildlife preserve? Yes, it is, Charles said warily. And aren't the wildlife on this preserve protected from all tampering by law? Well, I guess so, Charles said. What if those animals present a threat? I said to Charles. How many deer were killed by coyotes on this preserve last year? The owner said. Dozens, said Charles. Were the coyotes removed from the preserve? No, Charles said. The owner turned and shot me a triumphant look. John, Charles said, I know you have everyone's best interest in mind, but you're going to have to let this go. I glared at him. And what happens when this thing decides to eat humans? All the eyes in the room that had been on me suddenly found somewhere else to look. All but the owner. He was smiling from ear to ear. I think the pudgy little bastard was about to break into a happy dance. I searched the room for any support, but found none. I pulled my badge off my shirt, quietly laid it on the desk, and left. If that was the end of my story, I would say I had failed. I took my pension and rented one of the houses on the preserve. The owner had leaked through social media that a cryptid had been spotted on the preserve. As he had guessed, the cryptid hunters and TV crews came in droves, 
renting everything in sight. My goal was different. I already knew it existed. I knew how it got around without being detected. I stayed at one of the break-in houses. Every night I took a huge tuna that I had bought fresh that morning and laid it out beside the pond. I sat in the dark living room and watched the first night as it approached the fish with more caution than curiosity. After sniffing for a long time, it grabbed it and dove for the pond. Each night after, I laid out a fish and the creature became less cautious. It was being fed and the media frenzy was starving. The hunters had found nothing. There were no sightings as long as I fed it. Everyone had their cameras set up. The few that roamed around left me alone when they saw someone in the house. I guess they thought I was another cryptid hunter and respected my privacy. As the number of sightings stayed at zero, they started turning on the owner, calling him a fraud. His reputation plummeted. After a week with no sightings, people started leaving. In desperation, he did the wrong thing. He hired an actor to dress in a creature suit and roam around. Of course, the hunters in shows saw right through this and destroyed what was left of his reputation. I had rented the house for two weeks. Between the rent and the fish, my money was running out. I had kept the people safe, but what would happen when I stopped feeding it? I had managed to clear out most of the people so that they would be safe, but what about my fellow rangers? What would happen when it became desperate? When the starving creature no longer had houses full of food to break into? I had three more nights until I had to leave. I was out of money. The preserve had become a ghost town. As far as I knew, I was the only renter left. It was decision time. I sat staring at the large tuna on the table with a bottle of bleach next to it. Let it live and see what happens or kill it. I thought about this for a long time. Both options had merits and consequences. I chose a third option, a much more dangerous one. I took the fish out and laid it where I usually did, then backed up a few feet and stood there. Over an hour passed before the water stirred. I saw the head and eyes of the creature appear as it headed toward the fish, and then it stopped. It had seen me. I made sure to keep still with my arms at my side. It slowly approached and stood. It was a few feet away with the fish in between us. It studied me and sniffed the air, then became agitated. Perhaps it had smelled my scent before as a pursuer. It let out a soft hiss, but bent down and took the fish, keeping its eyes on me the entire time. Then once it had its meal, it did the most incredible physical display I've ever seen. It leapt 20 feet in the air and landed in a perfect dive right in the middle of the pond, leaving almost no splash. I let out a breath that I didn't realize I was holding and collapsed to the ground shaking. Once I had recovered, I went back inside and fell into a fitful sleep. That was only part of my plan. The next night would decide who lived and who died. I did exactly like the night before, minus the fish. The creature approached, stepped up to me, and looked around for the fish. I showed it my empty hands. It sniffed at them and growled, having smelled the scent of fish. It looked at my hands, and I wondered, if it was going to bite them off as a substitute. It hissed at me and sniffed my face. I saw it flexing its claws the whole time. I stared into its face, those massive razor-sharp teeth, 
and swallowed hard. I did all I could to stay still, to show I wasn't a threat. My heart hammered in my chest. It opened its jaws and showed me those horrible teeth. Its breath was a horrid stench I had never smelled and hoped to never smell again. I closed my eyes, not knowing if they would ever open. Seconds fell into minutes. I opened my eyes, and I was alone. There wasn't even a ripple in the water. I sighed. My decision had been made. It had shown restraint, and I would too. I went back inside, packed, and left. I could only hope and pray that the people that remained, including my former co-workers, would be safe. I went home and slept restlessly. In the morning, there was a report in the newspaper on a break-in at the Wildlife Preserve. They said the only thing that was taken were cans of tuna fish. I smiled ruefully and wondered how long it would stay that way. If you're reading this, don't go looking for this thing. If you see it, don't tell others about it. Just leave it alone and hope for the best. <laughs>